Welcome back. I'm Logan, your host for the Daily Bible Reading Podcast, where we are journeying through the Bible chronologically, taking it one day at a time. Today is day number 86. I'm so glad that you can join me today. We're going to be looking at Joshua chapter 16 to 18 today and continuing in the allotments of the promised land for the different tribes. Before we get started, let's pray. Today's prayer comes from the Valley of Vision, a collection of Puritan prayers and devotions by Arthur Bennett. This prayer is entitled, The Grace of the Cross. O my Savior, I thank Thee from the depths of my being for Thy wondrous grace and love in bearing my sin in Thine own body on the tree. May Thy cross be to me as the tree that sweetens my bitter maras, as the rod that blossoms with life and beauty as the brazen serpent that calls forth the look of faith. By thy cross, crucify my every sin. Use it to increase my intimacy with thyself. Make it the ground of all my comfort, the liveliness of all my duties, the sum of all thy gospel promises, the comfort of all my afflictions, the vigor of my love, thankfulness, graces, the very essence of my religion. And by it, give me that rest without rest, the rest of ceaseless praise. O my Lord and Savior, thou hast also appointed a cross for me to take up and carry, a cross before thou givest me a crown. Thou hast appointed it to be my portion, but self-love hates it. Carnal reason is unreconciled to it. Without the grace of patience, I cannot bear it, walk with it, profit by it. O blessed cross, what mercies dost thou bring with thee? Thou art only esteemed hateful by my rebel will, heavy because I shirk thy load. Teach me, gracious Lord and Savior, that with my cross thou sendest promised grace, so that I may bear it patiently, that my cross is thy yoke, which is easy, and thy burden, which is light. Amen. All right, let's get down to it, and I'll apologize in advance for the butchered pronunciations. It's kind of hard when you have read these all your life and thought of them one pronunciation, but then you learn Hebrew and you learn that that's not really the way that it's pronounced at all. Just for instance, like the tribe of Levi isn't really pronounced Levi, it's pronounced Levi. Uh, and the the tribe of uh, Gad isn't really Gad, it's closer to how we would pronounce God. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's really tough to try to maintain consistency in pronunciation. So words that I don't know, I usually try to pronounce them in the Hebrew pronunciation the way that it would sound if I was reading Hebrew. But for more common words, uh, I really struggled with like Balaam uh, instead of Balaam. Uh, Balaam would be the correct way to pronounce it, but Balaam is the way that everybody knows it. And so it's hard. Uh, Anyway, I appreciate you being with me. Let's go. Chapter 16. The allotment of the people of Joseph went from the Jordan by Jericho, east of the waters of Jericho, into the wilderness, going up from Jericho into the hill country to Bethel, then going from Bethel to Luz, It passes along to Ataroth, the territory of the Archites. Then it goes down westward to the territory of the Japhelites, as far as the territory of lower Beth Haran, then to Gezer, and it ends at the sea. The people of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim received their inheritance. The territory of the people of Ephraim by their clans was as follows. The boundary of their inheritance on the east was Ataroth Adar, as far as upper Beth Haran, and the boundary goes from there to the sea. On the north is Mikmathoth, 
Then on the east, the boundary turns around toward Ta'anath Shiloh and passes along beyond on the east to Janua. Then it goes down from Janua to Ataroth and to Na'ara and touches Jericho, ending at the Jordan. From Tapua, the boundary goes westward to the brook Cana and ends at the sea. Such is the inheritance of the tribe of the people of Ephraim by their clans, together with the towns that were set apart for the people of Ephraim within the inheritance of the Manassites, all those towns with their villages. However, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. Chapter 17 Then allotment was made to the people of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Joseph. To Machir, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilead, were allotted Gilead and Bashan, because he was a man of war. And allotments were made to the rest of the people of Manasseh by their clans, Abizer, Helek, Asriel, Shechem, Hefer, and Shemidah. These were the male descendants of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, by their clans. Now Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, son of Gilead, son of Machir, son of Manasseh, had no sons, but only daughters. And these are the names of his daughters, Mahla, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirzah. They approached Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun, and the leaders, and said, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance along with our brothers. So according to the mouth of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among the brothers of their father. Thus there fell to Manasseh ten portions, besides the land of Gilead and Bashan, which is on the other side of the Jordan, because the daughters of Manasseh received an inheritance along with his sons. The land of Gilead was allotted to the rest of the people of Manasseh. The territory of Manasseh reached from Asher to Michmathath, which is east of Shechem. Then the boundary goes along southward to the inhabitants of Entapua, the land of Tapua belonged to Manasseh, but the town of Tapua on the boundary of Manasseh belonged to the people of Ephraim. Then the boundary went down to the brook Cana. These cities to the south of the brook among the cities of Manasseh belong to Ephraim. Then the boundary of Manasseh goes on the north side of the brook and ends at the sea. The land to the south being Ephraim's and that to the north being Manasseh's, with the sea forming its boundary. On the north, Asher is reached, and on the east, Issachar. Also in Issachar and in Asher, Manasseh had Beth Sheon and its villages, and Ibliam and its villages, and the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, and the inhabitants of Endor and its villages, and the inhabitants of Ta'anak and its villages, and the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. The third is Naphath. Yet the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities. But the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. Now when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. Then the people of Joseph spoke to Joshua, saying, Why have you given me but one lot and one portion as an inheritance, although I am a numerous people, since all along the Lord has blessed me? And Joshua said to them, If you are a numerous people, go up by yourselves to the forest. And there, clear ground for yourselves in the land of the Perizzites and the Rephaim, since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. The people of Joseph said, The hill country is not enough for us. Yet all the Canaanites who dwell in the plain have chariots of iron, both those in Beth Sheon and its villages and those in the valley of Jezreel. Then Joshua said to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and to Manasseh, You are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours, for though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to its farthest borders, for you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron, and though they are strong. Chapter 18 Then the whole congregation of the people of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The land lay subdued before them. There remained among the people of Israel seven tribes whose inheritance had not yet been apportioned. So Joshua said to the people of Israel, How long will you put off going in to take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? Provide three men from each tribe, and I will send them out, that they may set out and go up and down the land. 
They shall write a description of it with a view to their inheritances, and then come to me. They shall divide it into seven portions. Judah shall continue in his territory on the south, and the house of Joseph shall continue in their territory on the north. And you shall describe the land in seven divisions, and bring the description here to me. And I will cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. The Levites have no portion among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their heritage. And Gad and Reuben and half the tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan eastward, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave them. So the men arose and went, and Joshua charged those who went to write the description of the land, saying, Go up and down in the land, and write a description, and return to me, and I will cast lots for you, here before the Lord in Shiloh. So the men went and passed up and down in the land, and wrote in a book a description of it by towns in seven divisions. Then they came to Joshua to the camp at Shiloh, and Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord. And there Joshua apportioned the land to the people of Israel, to each his portion. The lot of the tribe of the people of Benjamin, according to its clans, came up. And the territory allotted to it fell between the people of Judah and the people of Joseph. On the north side their boundary began at the Jordan. Then the boundary goes up to the shoulder north of Jericho. Then up through the hill country westward, and it ends at the wilderness of beth Aven. From there the boundary passes along southward, in the direction of Luz, to the shoulder of Luz, that is Bethel. Then the boundary goes down to Ataroth Adar, on the mountain that lies south of lower beth Haran. Then the boundary goes in another direction, turning on the western side southward from the mountain that lies to the south, opposite beth Haran, and it ends at Kiriath Baal, that is Kiriath Jerem, a city belonging to the people of Judah. This forms the western side. And the southern side begins at the outskirts of Kiriath-Jerim, and the boundary goes from there to Ephron, to the spring of the waters of Nephtua. Then the boundary goes down to the border of the mountain that overlooks the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is at the north end of the valley of Rephaim. And then it goes down to the valley of Hinnom, south of the shoulder of the Jebusites, and downward to Enrogel. Then it bends in a northerly direction, going on to Enshemesh, and from there it goes to Geliloth, which is opposite the ascent of Adumim. Then it goes down to the stone of Bohan, the son of Reuben, and passing on to the north of the shoulder of Beth Arabah, it goes down to the Arabah. Then the boundary passes on to the north of the shoulder of Beth Hogla, and the boundary ends at the northern bay of the Salt Sea, at the south end of the Jordan. This is the southern border. The Jordan forms its boundary on the eastern side, this is the inheritance of the people of Benjamin, according to their clans, boundary by boundary, all around. Now the cities of the tribe of the people of Benjamin, according to their clans, were Jericho, Beth Hoglah, Emek Keziz, Beth Araba, Zimaraim, Beth El, Avim, Para, Ophra, Chifar Ammonai, Ophni, Geba, twelve cities with their villages, Gibeon, Rama, Be'eroth, Mizpeh, Chephira, Moza, Rekim, Irpeel, Tarala, Zela, Halef, Jebus, that is Jerusalem, Gibeah, and Kiriath Jerem, fourteen cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the people of Benjamin, according to its clans. You know, this isn't the first podcast I've ever made. Uh, I've done several others with friends in the past, going all the way back to pretty much the beginning of podcasting. And normally it's a very arduous and, and time-consuming process of recording and editing and mixing and finding music that you can use on the podcast and sound clips and things like that to try to put it all together to make a nice finished product. But Anchor.fm makes that all so much easier. Uh, I use Anchor. It is free. And the creation tools that they allow me to use to record and edit the podcast right from my phone or right on my uh, computer, right through my web browser, just make it absolutely effortless. This is a, an amazing product that they offer uh, absolutely free. 
And so if you're looking to start a podcast, looking to get anything going, um, if you've got a great idea, I encourage you get out there and do it with anchor.fm. Uh, the, my favorite part about the entire process with anchor is that they, uh, will actually distribute the podcast for me. So whenever I'm done, whenever I'm all finished recording, I just hit done and I tell them when I want it to be published and it magically goes out to places like Spotify and Apple podcasts and Google podcasts and everywhere else that you guys listen to. Uh, so it's magical. And you can even make money from your podcast when you get uh, listeners, folks start listening to your podcast, as many people as are listening to the ads that you record, like this one, uh, you end up getting paid for those things. And so it's everything that you need to make a podcast all in one place. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, which I would encourage anybody to do, you've got a voice, we want your voice to be heard, go and download the free Anchor app now or go to anchor.fm to get started. So here in Joshua 16 to 18, it's easy to kind of look at it and think, oh, this is just another list of a lot of towns and landmarks so we can lay out on a map where all of these different tribal allotments are. But if that's all that you see, I encourage you to go back and read again. Look again, look closer at some of the details. I haven't mentioned it yet, but it's been said a couple of times in the text that these tribal allotments are happening by lot, which essentially means that, you know, they're drawing names. And it just so happens that Joseph got a very early drawing, and so he ended up with a huge allotment for Ephraim and Manasseh, really, Ephraim and the half-tribe of Manasseh on one side of the Jordan, and the other half of Manasseh had already received an allotment from Moses way back uh, before in Numbers. And so now it's coming up for these other tribes to do what they need to do, uh, to look at the rest of the land and begin to mark out territories so that they can cast lots and draw their straws to see who gets what territory. In today's text in Joshua 16, we see that the Gezerites in Canaan cause trouble for Ephraim and for the tribe of Ephraim to try to remove them out. Uh, They could not get them to go, or maybe they didn't try so hard to get them to go. Maybe they wanted to have a little bit of slave labor there ready for them to serve them. But We're going to see as we go further on in Judges that the idolatrous practices of these people are going to be a problem for Israel. David is going to try to get rid of them centuries later, and he's going to fail. It's going to take Pharaoh coming up from Egypt to defeat these Gezerites, and he does it as a wedding present for Solomon, who's getting married to his daughter. The lesson that I see here, and we see it here with the Gezerites, we see it also with the Canaanites. And Manasseh in Joshua 17, you can't manage sin, you can't control it. If you think that you have it under control and managed and put aside so that it's serving you, you are wrong. Sin will rear its ugly head and it will come back and it will bite you. You have been given the land by God. And here I'm not talking about a map, I'm talking about your body, and salvation. You have been given this promise by God that you are a new creature, that the old is gone and the new has come. The enemy, sin, and the flesh have no hold in your life. And so, what are you waiting for? Do you think that you have this sin under control and you've got it tucked aside? Put it to death now before it's too late. I'm going to look at Joshua chapter 17 in a little more detail here in a second, but I want to look at chapter 18 where we see uh, the spies being sent out into the northern part of the kingdom and finding these other tribal allotments here. They set up camp at Shiloh here in the beginning of chapter 18, and that is a nice secluded spot where this is going to be the place where the tabernacle stays for 200 years 
until the time of uh, Eli the priest and the beginning of Samuel, beginning of 1 Samuel, where we'll see the Philistines actually take the Ark of the Covenant. But Joshua gets a little frustrated with the people and he says, how long are you guys going to wait to go and possess this land. Go, get it. There's seven more tribes that still need a land, and they need to go and collect it and get it so that it, they can be assigned by this lottery, by, by lots. And so they come back finally after doing their survey of the land, and we get the assignment for the tribe of Benjamin. This is going to continue on as we go Uh, into tomorrow's reading as well as we see the rest of these tribes receiving their tribal allotments. But I want you to notice one thing about Benjamin's allotment. Uh, We see in it the city of Jebus or Jebus. Well, Jebus was the place where the Jebusites were. Uh, well, and, and it's we're told in the text that Jebus or the Jebusites land is Jerusalem. And it's going to take a while for these people to be pushed out. They may not seem like that big of a deal that the Jebusites are there, but this is going to become the capital city of Israel uh, in 2 Samuel, and we are going to see that these Jebusites are going to uh, be a little bit of a struggle for the people of Judah and the people of Benjamin, who both of them lay a bit of claim to this city. Uh, It seems as though it's a shared city between the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. It looks like it lays within the borders of Benjamin, but Judah has part of the city as well. We see that as we get into Judges chapter 1. We see Judah fighting against Jerusalem, um, and we see that Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that were there, but they continued to dwell with them in Jerusalem to that day when we get into Judges. And so, This is a common theme that as the people of Israel go in, they had been commanded to push out these people to destroy their temples and their holy places and their idols, but instead they are allowing them to remain with them. They are putting them under their control. They're causing them to be their slaves, but they're not doing what God has commanded. They are not getting rid of them completely. And so because of this, they continue to come back and afflict them over time. And this is such a picture of our own lives. Jesus tells us, he commands us to get rid of the sin in our lives, to take drastic measures to remove it from our lives. Yet, we continue to give it a little place in our life and think, I've got it under control. I've got this managed. And it doesn't work that way. It just does not work that way. I think we can see a contrast here between what we saw with Caleb yesterday and with Manasseh and with Ephraim and with Benjamin today. You know, Caleb wasn't afraid to tackle the giants in his hill country. Caleb trusted in God's promises like we talked about yesterday, but Manasseh was focused on the problems rather than the promises that he had been given. Manasseh goes back to Joshua and complains and says, hey, well, we need uh, some more land. We need better land because these Canaanites, they're hard to get rid of. And Joshua essentially says, hey, if you're strong, uh, go and take it. Go and do it. Yeah, I know they've got iron chariots, but you have the Lord your God. So go and take this land. God had already proven himself, but Manasseh fails to claim this prize, uh, the prize of the Valley of Jezreel, which is going to end up being the home of Ahab and Jezebel later on. We'll read about that as we get there. But each of us deal with these kind of spiritual strongholds. And I'm not talking about external circumstances over which we have no control, but rather about the dirty little closets within our own spiritual houses. We know where they are, and we know who can help us clean them out, but we still leave the enemy there to sneak back into our homes and hurt us day after day. Do you struggle with any of these? You know, things like discouragement, selfishness, lust, pornography, 
self-condemnation, addiction, pride, greed. These are all strongholds that Satan tries to get in our lives. And unless we get him out by killing these sins through the Holy Spirit, they will continue to come back and bite us over and over and over again. The good news is that God has outfitted us to take these sins out of our lives. Paul laid out the battle plan for us in Romans 8. He says that you must put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. We fight in faith. We pray and we fight. We put them to death. This isn't just some spiritual mumbo jumbo that, ooh, oh, I have to pray and give it over to God and then he takes care of it. No, we act and we cut off the hand. We pluck out the eye in order to rid ourselves of sin. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. We take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. We don't fight with these kind of worldly tactics when Jesus says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He didn't mean mutilate your flesh here. He said, take drastic measures to fight against sin. We capture our thoughts by not giving in automatically to every passion that grips us. Instead, we test those thoughts and discard them if they are disobedient to God's will. The people of Manasseh failed to capture their strongholds. The people of Ephraim failed to capture their cities. The people of Benjamin failed to capture their cities and to push out these foreign peoples because they didn't fight in God's strength, but in their own. And they gave in to that lie that their enemies were stronger. And they succumbed to a passion for ease and for comfort. They thought, well, I'm strong enough to put these in my service. But sin will never be in your service. It will only bite you in the end. Put it to death. Charles Spurgeon once said, there can be no peace between you and Christ while there is peace between you and and sin. I hope that you will trust God's word and trust that because of the death of Christ on your behalf, you are no longer a slave to sin. You can and you must put it to death through the Holy Spirit and through your works. Thank you for joining me today. I hope this has been encouraging to you. If so, please let me know by visiting the links that you find under the Connect With Us section in the show notes. I'm a simple man and I could use the encouragement. If you've been blessed enough that you would like to support the podcast, I would greatly appreciate that as well. You can go to buymeacoffee.com slash dbrpodcast to make either a one-time gift or to sign up for a monthly recurring membership gift. Until tomorrow... Keep reading and keep worshiping.